Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Marily Stamik and I am a researcher and the plant-based uh, product developer at Center of Food and Fermentation Technologies. So today I would like to briefly talk about who we are and what we do in general and then move on to uh, specifically talking about uh, plant-based products. Uh, so we are a research institution and we were founded in 2004 and we are located near the campus of Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, we are an R&D company in the field of synthetic and system biology. So this means that we can observe processes at cellular level and use different biotechnological uh, methods in the industry. Uh, we mainly focus on lactic acid bacteria and yeast, so how to use those uh, microorganisms, for example, uh, products like beer, bread, or even milk. And as we, we do a lot of uh, scientific work, but we, it is really important for us to implement those results and knowledge in the industry as fast as possible. And this is why we do a lot of uh, collaboration work with different uh, companies. Uh, as we are a scientific organization, we have a modern lab for different work groups, uh, highly qualified personnel with different PhDs and uh, graduate, uh, graduate students. Also, we do a lot of work with different uh, universities. And as I mentioned before, we have a lot of uh, different partners, international ones and here in Estonia. Uh, so here are some of the work we do. Uh, for example, Fermentation Group has a really good understanding of uh, cell metabolism. Uh, they do a lot of work with, uh, as I said, with lactic acid bacteria and different yeast and how to use those in uh, different processes. I work in the uh, food uh, department, so we do a lot of work with uh, plant-based foods, uh, different fermented drinks, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, and uh, bread and bakery, and so on. Also, we have a very interesting uh, nutrition group. Uh, they do a lot of work with our microbiome. So they research how does our diet affect our microbiome. And finally, we have a really cool assessment, uh, sensory assessment group. Uh, they are uh, professionally trained assessors. They give uh, feedback to the companies about their products, uh, about their texture, taste, do they have any off flavors, and so on. So now I would like to focus more on our uh, work, uh, mainly uh, plant-based alternatives in the case of meat and dairy. When you look at the food pyramid that has been conducted by the health organization in Estonia, on the left you can see Estonian nutritional recommendation per week. And on the right you can see our actual food choices. So Estonians eat three to uh, four times more meat than it's recommended. Uh, so this actually is a major problem, not to our health, but also to the sustainable food system, and therefore to the environment. And this understanding has also triggered us to do more R&D on uh, plant-based uh, products. Uh, luckily, today at the same time, we can sense the global flexitarian uh, uh, movement. Uh, so flexitarians are people who eat meat and dairy, but also uh, choose meatless meals uh, on some days. And this is very popular in Germany, UK, and in the United States. Uh, and for example, companies like Impossible Food or Beyond Burger, uh, Beyond Burger have made their mission to develop this kind of uh, products. And we also want to uh, go on the strain. Uh, so not only to have products for vegans and vegetarians, but also to have products that everyone would choose. So when we look at the market changes, we can see that products like tofu, seitan or tempeh, there have been in the Asian cuisine for centuries. Uh, when these kind of products started, started to emerge on Western uh, market uh, back in the 60s, companies started to make meat analogs uh, from soy and wheat mainly. 
And as from Nicole's uh, presentation, we saw that those first generation meat analogs weren't very tasty or appetizing. So today, uh, new generation vegetarian products use texturized vegetable protein, which we'll uh, talk about a little later. And also they use alternative proteins, not only from soy and wheat, but from different uh, sources like grains, legumes, uh, maybe from algae, fungi, and so on. So there are clearly uh, two different ways uh, companies are uh, developing their products. First, meat on first sight, so for example, kebabs or bacons from uh, plants. But we can sense, sense that more and more uh, companies want clearly uh, vegetarian products. So for example, pulled oats, uh, uh, by Golden Green. And what is interesting is that uh, a lot of companies from this traditional industry from uh, meat and dairy are coming to us to help them develop this new kind of plant-based products. So as I mentioned before, a lot of those uh, uh, products contain uh, texturized vegetable protein. So this is a method to restructure proteins. Uh, I didn't come uh, uh, empty-handed. I have some examples from the lab, so maybe we can help them distribute them around. Uh, I wasn't allowed to leave this box, so I cannot do this myself. <laughs> uh, so, yes, this is uh, uh, the raw ingredients for texturizing. This is uh, 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 soy protein powder and the other ones are texturized protein. So not only does this give a really nice and chewy texture to the uh, product, it also helps to break down any anti-nutrients that are in plants. Uh, so these are molecules that the plants uh, itself synthesizes to protect them from uh, higher organisms. Uh, but if we eat those kind of uh, molecules, then uh, it may inhibit protein digestion. So we had to lose them and make healthier products. Also, it uh, has longer uh, shelf life. So these, uh, I think there are in where? Uh, dry ones, their, their shelf life is almost a year. So it is really good for the companies to have a really nice stock in the warehouse. It doesn't go bad or anything. Um, and also, when we create this texture through this uh, uh, technology, we don't have to add any additives to the product. So this is a short video clip. So this is a pilot scale uh, extruder, and we also use the soy protein. So, of course, in the labs, there are uh, smaller uh, uh, machines uh, but in the industry, uh, they are a lot bigger. So as you can see, the uh, protein comes from the cooling area. Uh, the protein powder gets texturized. And uh, there are, this is the vessel where you put the uh, uh, protein powder in it. So quite a simple machine, a quite easy technology. And it creates really good uh, and interesting textures. So here are some examples that we have done with different partners. For example, soy meat for bonsoya, brown rice and pea burgers for ethical foods, and uh, pea protein mints for prana foods. So all of these uh, uh, products contain TVP and also different uh, uh, fibers. So for us, it is important to develop products that have really good sensory properties, texture, smell, and taste. This is the most important thing. Then people will buy those products. But at the same time, it, they have to be highly nutritious. Uh, when I look some of the alternatives that are on the market right now, they contain a lot of salt, uh, a lot of additives. So if you can make those kind of products with a new technology where we don't have to add any additives that we don't need, 
then I think this is the key also. And also we can have different uh, fibers, so it is good for our gut. Uh, and our main goal is also to uh, research alternative proteins, not only from soy and wheat, but from different grains like oat, uh, legumes, uh, beans, and e why not even from fungi, algae, or yeast. So this is really important for us, and we see the future in that. So we also do a lot of uh, research in, in plant-based milk alternatives. As you can see, the possibilities are endless uh, for plant-based milks. So mainly from grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and pseudo-grains. We've mostly done research on oat, soy, and different nuts. Uh, the production of uh, plant-based milk is quite easy. You have a raw material, uh, for example, nuts, grains, or seed. You extract the water, filter it. Uh, you may add some additives. Usually commercial milks have uh, different uh, stabilizers. Uh, then you have to uh, pasteurize it and package it. But when you look at the nutrition facts, actually commercial plant-based milks differ quite greatly from the traditional milk. Uh, usually it doesn't have enough energy, protein or fat in it. So it is challenging to implement the same technology from the dairy industry to plant-based product development. And here are some examples uh, about the product uh, production challenges. For example, when you took oat milk, it has a very weak emulsion stability because of the high starch content. I don't know if anybody has made oat milk before. Uh, it separates really quickly, it can be really slimy. Uh, so, but the solution for this is to treat it with enzymes. So enzymes are molecules that basically cut really long sugar molecules into smaller units. So this uh, oat milk becomes more stable. And also, uh, a lot of uh, plant-based milks uh, contain uh, anti-nutrients, what, uh, what I talked about earlier, uh, and some off flavors that people don't like. So it, the main solution for this is uh, temperature treatment, ultrasound treatment, blanching, and um, for nuts, roasting or steaming. And when we talk about fermentation, uh, lactic acid bacteria is the key. So these are organisms that are involved in the manufacture of thousands of fermented foods. So they consume carbohydrates and produce lactic acid, which, which gives the product its, uh, its uh, sour and tangy taste. Uh, when we talk about uh, fermentation in uh, uh, dairy products, mainly for uh, microorganisms are used as uh, common dairy starters. But as we've seen in our work, usually these kind of uh, bacteria don't uh, work with plant-based milks. So it is really important to choose the right culture. For example, some uh, dairy star uh, starter cultures give a pleasant sour aroma and taste, yet some have very unpleasant uh, and uh, beany smell, uh, taste and smell. So it is really important to do scientific work with those and to uh, figure out what, what works with milks the better, best. So this is just one example of what we did uh, in the lab and an, an experiment with commercial starter. Uh, and it showed that, for example, uh, in soya milk, it worked really well. It produced energy. We saw that uh, these kind of organisms are growing in that uh, media. It has enough food to eat, yet in some milks it didn't work at all. So this is why I want to stress that it is really uh, important to do scientific work with those kind of things to uh, have a high quality product. And as I mentioned before, monitoring the growth and activities of this culture is very important to guarantee a very high quality product. So methods based on measurements are different. You can look at the acidity, 
uh, metabolite analysis, and also heat flow with uh, uh, equipment called microcalorimetry, which we have in our lab also. So this is a very interesting machine. Uh, as you see the, uh, before the curves, it measures the energy or heat that the uh, microorganisms are producing. So we can get a really good knowledge of what those kind of starters do in that uh, media. And so we can uh, give companies examples uh, of what starter cultures to use, for example. Another thing is uh, improving the product development, uh, stability, sorry. A lot of uh, commercial milks and products use uh, additives, uh, but if we use scientific methods like uh, high pressure homogenization or ultrasound processing, we can uh, uh, get a really good stability milks and products, and we don't have to add any additives. So this is a, a, a project that we did with Bonsoya. Our aim was to develop a soy yogurt. A soy yogurt often has a really beany taste. A lot of people don't like them. So our mission was to get rid of those off flavors. And one way is by blanching with a sodium carbonate solution. So first we did uh, uh, soy milk, when we also got a really interesting res a residue, okara, which reminds something like a curd. I don't know if you know, beam in Estonia. <laughs> and it is really interesting to do also further experience with that uh, residue also, so we don't have to waste anything. Uh, then we ha added uh, pectin and inulin, which are naturally occurring fibers. They give this uh, very silky uh, texture to the yogurt. And then we added yogurt cultures and fermented it. So as you can see, there are many steps. Uh, and I think it is really important for uh, companies to do research and cooperation with this kind of institutes so that we can uh, have a really high quality product. So to conclude, the necessity and need for a plant-based product is increasing. We can sense that the market is ready for all kinds of products. Uh, yes, developing these products can be a bit tricky, uh, but this is where the science steps in and helps uh, companies to get really good products. And I think more cooperation between fruit producers and research institutes is necessary. Thank you.